Most people in Portland are not religious believers, uh, nor would they be called C and E. Don't even think about church on Christmas and Easter. Uh, they have no religious affiliation. Uh, Portland is the least religiously affiliated city in the United States. Uh, most people are what we would call secular. May, that may be how you describe yourself. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the crisis in secularism. First, let me define some terms. Secular is used three ways. One is secular society. Uh, that's a country that is not a theocracy. There's a separation between religious, religion and state. Second use of the term is a secular person. Secular person is a person who does not believe in God or not sure what they believe about God. Uh, everything ha has to have a scientific explanation. Third use of the term is secular age. Thus, the emphasis is on the here and now, not on the eternal. Uh, the thinking over the last five decades has been, isn't religion going away? I mean, as people get more educated, don't, won't they drop their religious superstitions? Uh, then uh, Pew Research uh, came out with a study in 2015 in the Washington Post printed, the world is expected to become more religious, not less. That was like a surprise to many people. Uh, in the secularist world, that was like a bombshell. Wait a minute. I thought we're supposed to become less religious as we get more educated. Well, what Pew found is that uh, the number of Christians in the world is increasing. We estimate conservatively 100,000 people become Christians every day. The number of Muslims in the world is increasing. But the number of secularists is de decreasing. They estimate that uh, secularists will decrease from 16.4% of the world's population today to 13.2% in 40 years. By 2020, Christianity will have grown from 11.4 million Christians in China, Korea, and Japan, 1.2% of the population, to 171 million, 10.5% uh, of the population. Uh, in 1910, uh, 12 million people were Christians in Africa, 9% of the population. By 2020, we estimate there will be 630 million, uh, or 49% of the population. Turns out people need religion. Strict secularists believe that we are only physical creatures. We don't have a soul. When we die, we just go back into the earth. This position is deeply counterintuitive to most people in the world. More and more people are embracing religion as a better representation of the human uh, uh, facts as a, a human existence. Parents, talk about this with your uh, kids. Uh, odds are your kids spend all day at school uh, uh, being steeped in secularism. Uh, teach them that, you know, that's not really not the best explanation for what you experience in life. Turns out, August, uh, secularism is facing a crisis. It doesn't match our experience as humans. Turns out, Augustine, the church historian, uh, is correct. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. Why is secularism in crisis? Two reasons. One, it doesn't match what we see in nature. A secularism is the belief that there is no God. Uh, nature is all there is. It evolved. Uh, the Apostle Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 1. He says, that theory seems very unlikely. If you want to follow along in the Bibles under the seats, uh, Romans 1 is going to be on page 1,126. I'll start at verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that we are without excuse. Paul says all of us can know that there's a God. It's plain from what we see in creation. Uh, Paul answers the unwritten objection, how can people be held accountable for their sins when they've never heard the truth about God? Paul says the answer is they can know about God from creation. All people are responsible because creation has given us ample evidence of God's existence. 
I like the, the story about the, the little girl, six-year-old, was in a drawing class. And she was working hard on something. And the teacher was fascinated because usually this girl was just kind of daydreaming and doodling. But today she was really intense. So the teacher walked to the back of the class to see what she was doing. She says, what are you drawing? She says, I'm drawing a picture of God. She says, how can you do that? Nobody knows what God looks like. And the girl responded, they will in a minute. Troy and I went out to eat. Uh, we tried to go out every Friday night, and we went to Harborside Restaurant down at Waterfront Park. It was a warm night. Yeah, this is a, a time back, and uh, we came out, and it had gotten dark, and the stars were out. The moon was, you know, partial, and, uh, you know, all the boats were there in the harbor, and some were out in the water with lights on. It was just beautiful. Are you going to tell me that what we see in the sky and the rivers and the lakes, how about Mount Hood? It just happened? I mean, it is a stretch to believe, to observe the intelligent design of a beautiful creation and deny the creator. I mean, come on. You see a, a, a cell phone, a, a, a TV, a, a car, uh, and you can tell they're intelligently designed. Our world is so carefully designed. I mean, uh, that we have the right amount of water, a little too much in North Carolina right now, but right amount of air, just the right distance from the sun so we don't burn up. The, the earth's rotating at just the right speed so that we don't all freeze or, or burn up. If you change the dial on the way the, the world works, just .001, human life would cease to exist. The fine-tuning in this world is such a strong argument for God that scientists have put forth the multiverse theory. That's the theory that with millions of planets in the world, it's bound to have one that's just right for human life, even though there's not a, a bit of evidence for this theory. In other words, either you take a step of faith to believe there is a God who designed the universe, or you take a step of faith to believe there isn't. Secularists believe in exclusive rationality, the belief that science is the sole arbiter of fact and what is real, and we should not believe anything unless we can prove it decisively using empirical evidence. But all of us, including secularists, have convictions about truth that cannot be proven scientifically. I mean, we believe in love. We believe that all human beings deserve to have human rights and justice and racial equality. Many people believe in evolution. You can't prove any of those things. So we should stop demanding that belief in God meet a standard of universally acknowledged proof that we don't apply to other commitments on which we base our lives. Secularism is in crisis because we demand a level of proof we don't demand in other areas. We're told that scientists believe only in science, only in evidence, while Christians live only on faith. That's just not true. Science teaches that light travels at 186,000 miles per second. How do we know that's true? Well, we measure it over and over again, right? You can't measure light traveling 186,000 miles per second at a, at a star millions of miles away. We take it on faith. Scientists live by faith as much as Christians do. The issue between scientists who do not believe in God and Christians who believe in God is not science versus faith. It's faith against faith. It takes faith to believe that God spoke the universe into existence, but it takes just as much faith to believe the universe has always existed or it exploded itself. Scientists take many things on faith. A science teacher was trying to make this point, and he was doing it using a ridiculing a, a Christian student. He said, have you ever seen Jesus? Have you ever heard him talk to you? Have you ever touched him? Have you ever smelled him? Have you ever tasted him? Well, another student stood up and so, you know, he's, his, his point was, well, then how do you know Jesus exists? Another student stood up and he says, well, using your logic, have any of us here ever seen our teacher's brain? 
Have you ever heard it working? Have you ever touched it? Have you ever smelled it? Have you ever tasted it? Well, how do we know the teacher has a brain? Why should we listen to his lectures? Secularists take a lot of things on faith just like Christians do. Secularity is not the absence of faith, but a new set of beliefs about the universe. They cannot be proven, and they are not self-evident to most people. Secularism doesn't match what we see in nature. Or it's not the best explanation for what we see. The second reason secularism is in crisis is because it doesn't match the moral facts of the world. Secularists do not believe in God and that there are moral absolutes. But we can't live in a world without morals. We long for justice and human rights and racial equality. But when you ask why are these things right, if we're all just worthless molecules that evolved from pathetic globs of algae, They say it's just right. But if you press and say, well, if there's no God, where does this right come from? They have no answer except to say it's based on the survival of the fittest. The appeal to human rights based on survival of the fittest self-interest is uncompelling. By contrast, Dr. Martin Luther King sought a just society on a considerably stronger footing. He argued that segregation is not just impractical for the overall good, but that it was a sin. He knew that human rights have power only if they really exist. He quoted the Bible, let justice roll down like water. The secular approach to justice pales before the Christian foundation for justice used by Dr. King. Secularism is in crisis because when we remove God, we can't stand the lack of morals that follows. The Apostle Paul addresses this in Romans 1. He tells us that when you remove God, immorality increases in at least three ways. First, we become confused in our thinking. Uh, This is Romans 1 verse 21. Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. When we ignore God, Paul says our thinking becomes muddled. We may claim to be wise, but we become foolish. Notice that once we turn our backs on God, we don't cease to be religious. We don't just stop worshiping. We just worship something else. We're all inherently religious. If secularists don't believe in God, they don't cease to believe. They believe in something else. The second thing that happens when we remove God is that we become confused about our sexuality. Therefore, God gave them over. This is verse 24. Three times Paul uses this phrase, God gave them over. It doesn't mean that God gives up on us, he ceases to care about us. It means he gives us over to the consequences of not believing in him and removing him from from our lives. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Paul's talking about the abuses of heterosexuality. Once separated from God, our moral sense is obscured. We abuse the gift of sexuality and do things degrading to our bodies. This explains the multi-billion dollar porn industry. It's insane. Paul goes on, verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is one of two places in the New Testament that Paul mentions homosexuality. I'm aware that it's politically incorrect to talk about uh, homosexuality, Uh, but this is God's word. I didn't write it. Peter says that all writers of Scripture spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. My job as a pastor is to teach what God 
says in his word. I don't have the freedom to skip over passages, uh, skip ones that are politically incorrect or difficult. Paul teaches that homosexual practice is not in keeping with God's design. What's God's design? Genesis chapter 1. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Paul says this is God's design for marriage. We cannot embrace the belief that homosexuality is an unalterable <coughs> orientation that can no, no more be changed than the color of one's eyes. What people who teach that homosexuality is an unalterable uh, orientation don't want you to know are about the thousands of people that have transitioned from the homosexual lifestyle uh, out of uh, help with organizations like the Fellowship in East Portland or Exodus International. Paul talks about the transformation that God can do in a person's life in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. The Corinthians had been forgiven and transformed. The gospel of Jesus Christ has power to change lives. The third thing that happens when we remove God is we become callous and criminal towards others. Verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Uh, Paul repeats for the third time, God gave them over. When we leave God out of our lives, since God is the source of all good, then God gives us over to the consequences of trying to live life without him, broken relationships. When we fail to make room for God, not only do we become confused in our thinking and our sexuality, we also lose our ability to love our neighbor. Now, Paul writes one of his famous lists. Paul's famous for his list. He has a list of spiritual gifts. He has a list of uh, fruit of the Spirit. Here's his list of what happens when we leave God out of our lives. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent, invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. He throws in disobedience to parents to catch the students. Now, notice what they don't have. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Why the list? I think Paul's trying to catch you. He'll catch you on one, if not another. Churches often speak about some items on the list, but they ignore the others. Paul doesn't do that. His point is that we're all guilty. We're all prone to leave God out of our lives. And when we do, bad things happen. When we remove God from our lives, we become muddled in our thinking confused in our sexuality, and corrupt toward others. But I want you to notice one more thing. Notice that the crisis is cumulative. Uh, don't miss Paul's point that the crisis intensifies and builds. When we turn away from God, we don't cease to worship, but we worship human beings, then birds, followed by animals, and finally reptiles. We end up worshiping snakes that we fear. When Jory and I bought our first house, our yard was a mess, and so we invited about 12 high schoolers over to help us clean it up. And we had one log that was like uh, six feet long and about four feet wide, and, and we rolled it out, out of the way, and when it did, snakes slithered out all over the place. And guys, we all scattered. Uh, the funny part of the story is that one girl was helping us that day, and she had no fear of snakes. She just went and picked them up, put them in a jar, When you study idolatry through history, you see it always has a downward spiral. Uh, this happened in Egypt. They worshipped Amon Re, a man god, then the condor and the eagle, then animals, particularly the bull, and finally they worshipped snakes. We find this, uh, this uh, accumulative effect in our sexuality. 
Paul says our sexual perversions get progressively worse. And then Paul ends his list of sins, verse 32. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Not only do we do these things, but we give a standing ovation to others who do them. Not only do we do what is wrong, but we praise others who do the same and encourage others to join in. Paul says this is the bottom rung of the ladder. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. Evil has become good, and good has become evil. Those who object to evil, they're the bad ones. Secularism is facing a crisis. One, the crisis is that secularism doesn't match what we observe in nature. The notion that there is no God who designed the beauty we see and, 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 the, and, and there's no designer behind this seems counterintuitive to a growing number of people. And it seems illogical to, to demand a standard of proof for the existence of God that we don't require for our other beliefs. Two, it doesn't match with the moral facts we see. People around the world long for justice and, and human rights. Yet these rights only make sense if there is a God behind them who established right and wrong. Am I suggesting that secularism is dead? Not at all. It's alive and well in our country. But there are cracks in its ideology becoming apparent to more and more people. So we can say with confidence, God, it makes more sense to believe in you So I commit my life to you. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul, inspired by you, the truth about life, that if we take you out of our lives, bad things happen. I want to give you an opportunity just to pray. I think it's always important. And uh, would you tell God what you heard today and what you want to do about it, what you want to commit to Him. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can ask Him to come in, forgive your sin. So I'll give you just a minute to pray. Lord God, thank You that we can believe in You, that it, that makes the greatest sense out of what we see outside and what we experience inside in our conscience, that there's got to be right and wrong. You've written that on our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.